Good afternoon and welcome to our oncology lecture series. I am Dr. Galen Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. Special thanks and welcome to all our peers in San Salvador. Thank you for joining. During this interactive presentation, you'll have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located in the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Juan Pretel. His presentation is titled, Unplanned Excision of Soft Tissue Sarcoma. Dr. Juan Pretel is a board-certified musculoskeletal oncology surgeon and the chief of musculoskeletal oncology surgery at Baptist Health Miami Cancer Institute. Dr. Patel specializes in benign and malignant musculoskeletal tumors and skin cancers affecting the musculoskeletal system. Dr. Patel received his medical training at University Universidad Peruana Gayetano Heredia in Lima, Peru. He attended Hosp uh, Hospital Universitario 12 de Octubre in Madrid, Spain for a non-orthopedic surgery residency. He completed a fellowship in AO, which by the way, stands for abbreviation as an abbreviation for Association of Osteothentesis, uh, Trauma at Leeds General Infirmary in Leeds, England, followed by a pediatric orthopedic research fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a pediatric orthopedic clinical fellowship at Campbell Clinic, uh, Livonher Le uh, Children's Hospital in uh, uh, in Tennessee, and a musculoskeletal oncology clinic fellowship at Jackson Memorial Hospital University of Miami in Miami, Florida, of course. Prior to joining Baptist Health Miami Cancer Institute in 2022, Dr. Patel worked at the University of Miami, where he was an associate professor of orthopedic and faculty of the orthopedic surgery residency program in musculoskeletal oncology fellowship. He also was a director of clinical research in the Division of Musculoskeletal Oncology Surgery. Dr. Patel's research has been published in high impact national and international orthopedic and oncology journals. He has been a speaker in national and international meetings and faculty for international musculoskeletal oncology courses. He is an active member of the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society and fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. He also is a diplomat of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. How fortunate we are to have you, Dr. Pratel. Thank you so much for your time for accepting our uh, invitation. The floor is yours to begin the presentation. Well, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Hakim, uh, for this invitation. And thank you very much for all the audience here that uh, give me their time. To, to listen to this, uh, I think, very interesting topic. Um, let's see. Let me share the presentation here. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, so as it was said before, uh, I'm going to talk about unplanned excision of soft tissue sarcomas. I am a um, uh, as Dr. Hakim said, a Chief of Orthopedic Oncology Division at uh, Miami Cancer Institute and also a Clinical Professor of Orthopedics uh, in the Herbert Wertheim uh, College of, of Medicine. I have no disclosures. So this is, um, this is a patient I saw during my, <clears throat> during my fellowship uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and this is a patient that initiated my curiosity about this topic of the implant excisions. Uh, this patient was about 55 year old when I saw him and, and he came because he was working uh, lifting some heavy heavy objects and then he he felt like a like a plop on, on his on his arm it was uh, thought that this was like a, a biceps biceps uh, tear muscle and and he went to the orthopedic surgeon they did uh, a CT right of the of the arm and they found they saw this and they interpret this as a hematoma. So they proceed with surgery and they start draining the hematoma, which was really a sarcoma. Uh, so, and you can see here how 
there is a, a chemosis around the incision, how, how broad are the, the stitches. You can see here the drain that was placed on the lateral aspect, which contaminates all the all the field um, of, of the surgery. So, so yeah, so when I saw this patient, I, I said, you know, oh my God. And, and, and that, that was the, uh, the circumstance that allowed me to start doing research on this, on this topic. And, and actually after this, after this patient is when we start writing and we wrote the first guidelines of treatment of this, uh, of this condition in 2015. So, the the term and plan excision was described by Giuliano and Elber in 1985. So it's, it's a very old concept. The idea is that when you do a tumor resection without preoperative diagnostic modalities and without the intent to achieve tumor free margins, right? You know, what we call the negative negative margin when is when there is normal tissue around around the tumor. Now. This uh, definition is very is, is when we talk about the total implant excision that we are going to talk about later. Uh, but um, in general, the idea is that the person that is doing the surgery really is not thinking about the sarcoma. And then they do the surgery, the pathology after a few days come, and it says, oh, it's a sarcoma. And they you said, oops, right, was a sarcoma. So that's why these surgeries are also called the oops procedures. So the problem is that substitute sarcomas are rare and they're unexpected. Uh, so there is uh, an inappropriate evaluation and that and uh, mistreatment is, is common. Uh, but this is this is something that involves, you know, not only orthopedic surgeons, I mean also plastic surgeons, general surgeons, dermatologists, I mean a bunch of different type of uh, subspecialties. So I think it's super important for all of us that at some point in, in our professional life, we'll see a patient with a bump to know these concepts, to know that this exists. So we don't, you know, make these, these mistakes. And the important thing here is that even though there is some education about this topic, uh, several studies have reported that these unplanned excisions represent about 18% to 66% of new patients referral to sarcoma centers. So you can see, you can see that the big, how big this is a problem for, for us, right? For orthopedic oncologists. This is another patient that I had a uh, referral recently, um, also mid-age adult with that bump on the on the volar aspect of the wrist. He had an MRI and the MRI was read as a schwannoma, which is a benign tumor from the tendon from the from the nerve, right? Um, the orthopedic surgeon read the MRI, they really didn't even saw the imaging or misinterpret the imaging. And they proceed to, and this was a hand surgeon, right? And they proceed to remove the tumor. And of course the tumor was removed with no margins. He, he need uh, another surgery and radiation, et cetera. So you can see how one misdiagnose can develop into subsequent multiple problems for the, for the patients. So when we have a patient with a soft tissue mass, right? How, how do we have to approach these patients? Um, all, all soft tissue masses have to be approached with cautious and initial assessment should begin with a comprehensive history and physical. For the history, we have to see if this is a painless mass. Uh, now, usually these sarcomas rarely will have any uh, systemic symptoms, fever, weight loss, or malaise, like the carcinomas. Uh, if there is a rapid tumor growth, which will suggest malignancy, and also if there is some exposure to certain, you know, industrial uh, chemicals such as phenocyatic acid, uh, chlorophenols, uh, dioxin, and ionizing radiation. Now, there are some clinical features that will tell us, oh, you know what, this is maybe a sarcoma. Uh, the size, for example, more than five centimeters, if there is rapid growth, if there is a size less than five centimeters, but it's adherent to the fascia surrounding uh, structures, and also we have to see if there is any regional lymph node that could be involved uh, because there are certain uh, sarcomas that can have more tendency to metastasize to the lymph nodes. Um, regarding the imaging studies, always, always start with biplanar uh, radiograph, meaning AP and lateral views, because we can see how it, if there is any osseous matrix, if there is any calcifications, bone invasion and periosteal reaction. Now, usually, the x-rays in soft tissue sarcoma will be negative, but in the few cases where 
there can be some positive signs. It can really help us to make a diagnosis. The CT basically is to see the extent of cortical uh, destruction. Ultrasound is a very cost-effective um, uh, imaging method and can identify certain features such like the size, location, depth, and presence of hyperemic vasculature and Doppler. However, the problem is that it's very dependent on who is doing the ultrasound. So, you know, uh, even though it's cheap and fast, but we, you have to uh, uh, be very careful who is doing the, the, the ultrasound and if that person is really experienced doing these, these procedures. And of course, the MRI. The MRI is the, the gold standard, okay, for uh, assessment of soft tissue sarcomas and assessment of patients after an unplanned excision of these soft tissue sarcomas. The MRI is good to assess the size, depth, relationship to neurovascular structures, the heterogeneity, which is a common feature in uh, malignant tumors, necrosis, also is highly suspicious for malignancy, the gadolinium enhancement, what we call the contrast, very important. Always, when you have suspicious for a sarcoma or, you know, a malignant mass, you have to always order MRI with and without contrast. Um, this MRI provides excellent anatomical details that will facilitate the biopsy if we are planning to do, and also surgical planning. And the MRI should be performed uh, before the biopsy to avoid misinterpretations because, um, and this is more when we used to do more open biopsies because when you do the open biopsy, there is more inflammation, you know, disruption of planes, will be edema after, after the procedure. So usually if you do the biopsy, open biopsy and then the MRI, then all those changes can hide or can, uh, you can misinterpret some uh, features that you can see. Nowadays, the gold standard is to do core needle biopsies which really doesn't interfere too much with the uh, uh, MRI findings like when you do an open biopsy. So here you have two, two examples, clinical examples. You have in the in this in the upper uh, left uh, hand, you see this, this bump in the medial distal thigh. This is a very, very uh, common location for sarcoma. So you see a mass there, you know, you have to think first in a sarcoma then in a benign, benign thing. And here in this X-ray, you can also see these, these calcifications, which is very um, uh, suggestive, but not super common of synovial sarcoma, for example. Here you have on the top, this hyper echogenic, you know, uh, in Doppler for the ultrasound. And here on the, on the bottom, the MRI with hypointensity one, hyperintensity two, and then there is internal necrosis in post-contrast uh, imaging. Now, on the other hand, there is few tumors, and one of, of these tumors is, are the ones that can be diagnosed only with MRI. And this is the lipomatous masses, right? Like the lipomas or atypical lipomas. So here you can see an atypical lipoma, uh, which usually follows, follows all the uh, sequences of fat on an MRI. So it will be hyperintense in T1, hyper in, hypointense in T2 with fat uh, suppression like you can see in this in this uh, image. So in general, as we said, when you have a patient with a soft tissue mass, you have to do first a complete history and physical, and then you have to see, you know, the features that we were discussing, if the mass is more than five centimeters, if it's less than five centimeters, if it's more than five centimeters, deep, growing rapidly, non-painful, uh, you have to do an MRI with and without contrast. If it's less than five, but adhering to deep uh, uh, fascia or surrounding structure, also an MRI. If it's less than five, superficial to fascia, mobile, stable in size. And this is very important, stability in size. That you can assume probably this is something benign. And then you can do serial examination with clinical exam, MRI slash ultrasound. And when you have the MRI with and without contrast and you have the suspicious of this is a sarcoma, then it's better to refer to a sarcoma center so they can do all the workup starting with a, with a biopsy. So what do we do when we are surrounded of these patients, right? You have here different examples of different unplanned excisions and how this patient presents to to the uh, to the to the office, right? And you can see, you know, here we are seeing the end the end result, right? 
when we see a patient for the first time in our office with a sarcoma, we see the patient only with the bump. And we start from there and we go forward to the surgery. Here is like, it's like a puzzle because the patient already comes with the surgery and you have to build back what happened with that patient. This is what they left for you. Now you have to fix it. So the first thing you have to do to know is the patient profile, right? The age of these patients, usually the same age as a, as a sarcoma, right? Mid age, adults, mid age. Many of these patients, 65% will have a history of trauma. Okay, and that's that's a, that's an issue because 65% history of trauma, you will think a hematoma. So many, many times, these patients, when they have deep masses, are confused with hematomas. Now, the size. Usually, patients that undergo implant excision usually will have smaller tumors, usually, you know, five centimeters or less, and usually they are superficial, you know, and, and usually are in the in the trunk, um, in the trunk. Um, now, um, uh, Nakamura in 2022 no, did um, a retrospective study and, they, and after the a logistic regression analysis, they saw that this patient with implant excision usually was associated with males with tumors that were smaller, superficial, and located in the trunk, right? When they were compared with plant excisions. Here, as I said, most of the times will be patients that come with superficial tumors. Now, the most common misdiagnosis when they are superficial are lipomas, and when they are deep are hematomas. And it's basically because of what we discussed before, that a lot of these patients will come with a history of uh, previous trauma. The most common pathologic diagnosis, it will depend. It will depend on the series that are published. Uh, it has been described, synovial sarcoma, uh, UPS, liposarcomas. Uh, in 2019, we published our, seri our case series when I was at UM, and uh, we, we found that uh, the most common uh, soft tissue sarcoma in patients with implant excision was myxofibrosarcoma. sarcoma. And this is important because this particular tumor is a very locally aggressive tumor that has a pattern of growth that is infiltrative. So it, it infiltrates the, tish the tissues are not well defined like other sarcomas. So when you don't do a, an oncologic resection from the beginning, then it's very difficult to really know where are the true margins of this tumor. And when you are doing the tumor rate excision that we are gonna talk about in a few minutes, this is very difficult to, to know. And, and this patient goes through many, many surgeries because they have to do re-resection, re-resections and re-resections. Uh, also, Takemori um, also found that the myxofibrosarcoma sarcoma was the most common uh, tumor. Classification, as I said before, you have the um, uh, total implant excision is when nothing is done and the tumor is removed like as it is, right? And the partial implant excisions that are when some, some workup is done, you know, like an MRI, ultrasound, something. Uh, but that those imaging studies are misinterpreted. So nobody think that even though I have an MRI, I didn't think it was a sarcoma. So, or even though, even there are some cases that biopsies are done and the biopsy is misinterpreted also. And they do a biopsy and it is read as a benign tumor. They do the resection and then it comes as a sarcoma. So it is very important to, to know. And this happens because usually, you know, uh, community physicians, uh, radiologists, or community pathologists are not experienced in musculoskeletal tumors. So many of these errors can happen or miss, not errors, but misinterpretation can happen. And, you know, the, the problem is that then other physicians follow all these and, and it's, a, you know, like a chain of, of, of mistakes. So, when you have a patient with an unplanned excision, you have to ask yourself three things. What was done to the patient? And that's the that concept that I was saying, the puzzle, right? We have to we have to play detective. We have to see what was the patient, what was done to the patient, because we only are seeing the end product of the surgery that was done. Then what is going on with the tumor? If there is any tumor left locally, and if that tumor also has already spread or not. 
And then finally, what should I do when I already have the information from the other two? So the first thing is that these, these patients have to be managed in a multidisciplinary sarcoma centers, okay, where there is all different types of specialties that are involved in the care of these, of these patients. The treating team requires operative reports. Okay, we have to ask for operative reports to see what was done, you know, what planes were um, implicated in the surgery, um, if there was cross contamination, for example, right? For example, you have two masses, you remove one mass, and then you use the same instruments or tools to remove the other mass. So if the first mass was a sarcoma and the second one was a benign tumor, then you're going to have a recurrence of a sarcoma in the benign tumor site. Right, so that that's that's something important you have to see. It's very important to request if any diagnostic imaging was done because if there was a diagnostic imaging, let's say an MRI before the resection, then when you are planning your re-resection, even though you don't see any macroscopic tumor, then you can say, okay, if, if I don't see any tumor now, but the tumor was here before. So then you can plan the resection more or less around where the tumor was initially and add some more additional tissue where you think this could be contaminated tissue, right? Pathology reports, as I say, is super important and you have to request the slides so that MSK pathologists of the sarcoma center can review these slides. And for example, Ro Ro uh, uh, Randall in 2004 showed that 37% of the histologic diagnosis that came from outside were incorrect, 37%. So imagine the amount of misdiagnosis or incorrect diagnosis that are done outside sarcoma centers. You have to see the surgical site, the skin incisions, right? If they are transverse or oblique incisions, because these, when you do these type of incisions, you can have contamination of adjacent compartments. You have to see, and this will end up in having larger resection areas, compromised lymph function, mass, the need to use muscle flaps or skin flaps for coverage. Usually this is done with a plastic surgery team and wider radiotherapy fields. Also, you have to see if there is a presence of hematoma because the hematoma potentially can contaminate all the other, you know, uh, compartments uh, around, and if there was any drain, like in the first case that I present, if the drain was in line with the incision or not, because if it's not in line, then you are contaminating all the area that goes through the path of the of the drain. And the skin closure, right? If the, if the skin closure was done by liars, if it was um, left open, like in this, like in this case, because here, usually, when you are doing the tumor ready excision, you have to re resect all the area where the uh, previous incision was done. Now, that's what it was done with a patient. Now, what is going on with the tumor, right? And that is called what we do the staging. The staging is a process to know what is going on with the tumor, what is going on with the tumor locally and distantly, right? Locally is to see the tumor, the, the surgical bed. And that's the MRI is the gold standard. And in the distance, the minimum test that you can do is a CT of the chest, because that's the most common uh, organ where these sarcomas will uh, metastasize. Now, um, the problem with the MRI and an implant excision is that because there is no, in the cases where there is no tumor, palpable tumor, microscopic tumor, then you really don't know exactly how much of the, for example, changes in the MRI are microscopic tumor or not. And there are some, some people that have been trying to do some uh, studies about this, but you can see that what they have found is that the sensitivity is low, right? It's 0 0.64 by Davies, and then uh, Steven Rock also 0 0.75. So, so you really, with an MRI, it's very difficult uh, to rule out like there is a tumor left or not when there is microscopic tumor. Um, uh, Kiwi in uh, 2021 um, found also that sensitivity was 65.9%. So, um, and even, even when the mass is present, right? The problem is that you can see some residual tumor, but 
the surrounding changes that you can see on the MRI, you are not sure if they are tumor or not. So that's why it's very difficult to really assess the margins or the, you know, your surgical planning when an implant decision has been done. Now, we already saw what was going on, what was done with the patient, what is going on with the tumor now, what should I do, right? Well, what should I do with the treatment of these patients? There are three components. Tumor bed excision, that is the re-resection of the area where the tumor was, radiation, and chemotherapy. The tumor bed excision, the goal is to remove residual sarcoma. It could be macroscopic or micro, uh, macroscopic or microscopic, and the potential contaminated tissue with negative margins. Now, the rationale for this procedure is based on the observation that gross and microscopic residual disease is often present following unplanned excisions, which has prognostic implications. Here you can see this is from our publication from 2015, and you can see different authors that they found from 18% up to 60% that you or 72% that you can have tumor residual tumor in the tumor in the tumor bed excision and as you can see that the local recurrent rate based on the residual tumor also changes so when you have negative residual tumor the local recurrent rate is much lower than if you have a positive or or residual tumor in the tumor bed excision so as you can see, this has prognostic uh, implications in the oncological outcome of the patient. Now, there are some authors that um, are trying to, to, to be less aggressive with these situations. And they design or they, yeah, they design this concept of the wait and watch approach. So they say, okay, I am not seeing, I'm not seeing tumor, right? Uh, maybe all the tumor was removed. Um, I don't want to be too morbid. So let's see, let's see what happened. So they wait and watch. And if there is a recurrence, then we're gonna do the re-resection of that area. The problem is that as we're gonna see, when there is recurrence, the recurrence will affect the overall survival of the patient. So we don't have to wait until there is a recurrence to act on these patients. And uh, Mori in 2008, uh, in his uh, retrospective study showed after a multivariate analysis that the tumor bed excision was in an independent predictor of local control. So if we have a good local control, we're gonna decrease the chances for uh, a future uh, local, local recurrence. Um, here, even in, even in cases where the tumor were small, uh, meaning less than five centimeters, you can see that there was a, um, a effect of the tumor bed excision in the local control. Five-year local recurrence free survival, you can see that in the patient with tumor bed excision, they had 92.8%, and where there was no tumor bed excision, 52.6%. So it's significant difference in the local recurrence in these in this, uh, patients. Also the same thing here, um, you can also see, and this is what I was saying, uh, Zhang in 2023, this is a recent, recent study, they saw that when there was a local recurrence, the five-year overall survival, right? And the five-year local recurrence free survival, so the two oncological uh, oncology outcomes that are very important, both were affected if you compare with no residual tumor, right? So significantly they decrease uh, in percentage. So when you are doing a tumor bed excision, you have to resect the prior operative incision. And that's why I was I was saying that if you have a very wide incision, you, you, you feel a resection is, uh, it has to be uh, wider. You have to include the adjacent uh, calf of skin, soft tissues based on operative reports, pathology reports, physical exam, and MRI. And when I say pathology reports, it's because there are some tumors, like what I was saying, mixofibrosarcoma or dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, that they have an infiltrative pattern of, of, of growth. So in those cases, even if you have a preoperative MRI, let's say that you preoperative before the implant excision, 
and you say, okay, this, this is where the tumor was, then you have to say, oh, but the tumor was here, the potential contamination was here, but this tumor per se has an infiltrative pattern of growth. So probably I have to be a little bit more wider with my resection. And uh, the problem is that the an adequate surgical resection is difficult in these cases because there is a scar tissue. There is loss of the normal anatomy of the, of the different planes. And there is a lack of palpable mass in many, in many cases. This is another, another study that we published uh, two years ago. And we asked ourselves, you know, if, if there is any, any advantage of doing intraoperative assessment in this patient, right? We do the resection, intraop, we, we take it to the pathologist, we examine the specimen with the pathologist and we see if we have, you know, uh, good um, uh, negative margins. And what we found is that the, if in, in, on the hands of an experienced MSK pathologist, an intraoperative assessment of the, of the specimen uh, in unplanned excision was very accurate and it was very similar to the plan to the plan excisions. And on top of that, we also found that it was uh, useful because in, in some of the cases, we had to do re-resections during the same procedure. So that will save that patient another surgery in the future. Because usually, you know, you do that re-resection and you might not do this intraoperative assessment. Then patient goes home, pathology came back and they say, oh, you know, your margins are still positive. So then you have to go again to the OR. But if you do an intraoperative assessment, then with an MSK pathologist, then you might save that extra surgery in these, in these patients. Now, the question is, I have a patient uh, with this unplanned excision, they come and they are very anxious and, and they will say, you know what, you have to do this re resection as soon as possible. Um, so that's also a question that some authors have, have made themselves. And um, Hang in 2011, they compared two groups with a cutoff time of 32 days. And they saw that there was no difference in local recurrence if you treat the patient after 32 days or before 32 days. So it's not so clear, you know, what would be the cutoff to see if there is any changes in the oncological outcomes. So the oncological outcomes seems more to be related to residual tumor, right? Or the grade of the tumor or the size of the tumor rather than the timing when you are doing the re-resection. Now, this is the big question, right? This is the million dollar question. How much should it, should be resected? When you are doing a plan excision, is is I mean, it's not easy, but it's kind of more straightforward because you have the MRI and then you can see based on the anatomy how much you have to resect, more or less. But in this case, as I said before, many times there is no palpable mass, there is a lot of edema, you don't know, sometimes you don't, you have an operative report that doesn't describe well what they did, where they were, what compartments were violated or not. So then you are like, what should I do, right? Uh, and this is a perfect example. Right? Nurse, get on internet, surgery.com, scroll down and click, are you totally lost? And and this is kind of sometimes, this is the, the feeling that we have, right? Uh, this patient comes and and and, and they, they ask you, how much do I have to resect, doctor? And you're like, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I will try to put this puzzle together, but unfortunately you might need to have a second surgery or a third if I cannot be able to remove the whole, the whole tumor. And of course, as a consequence, this will make these tumor bed excisions morbid, right? And you will see that in these cases of unplanned excisions, there is a greater use of flaps or skin graft, right? Like in the uh, study by Potter in 2008, 30% versus five. Also Arai in 2010, same thing, 71 versus 47%. More flaps, more skin graft, more complex reconstruction. And usually the plastic surgery team has to, has to be involved. This is a, a, a systematic review meta-analysis that, that we just published in January of this, of this year. And we included 16,949 soft tissue sarcomas 
with 6,017 unplanned excisions, 35%. So this is the largest study published uh, until now uh, on this topic. And what we found is that, as we were saying, this, this uh, procedures are very morbid and the plastic surgery reconstruction, right? Is uh, there is a higher uh, risk, the risk ratio is 1.25 being uh, uh, statistic statistically significant. The reconstruction rate and, and size of skin defects are significantly higher. And also the skin defects are about 1.9 times larger in unplanned excision than planned excision. So all of these give you an idea how bad things can go after these uh, oops procedures. Now, as I was saying before, also we have seen like uh, Moratel published in 2020, patients with unplanned excisions will have more surgeries, 3.5 versus 1.4. The unplanned excision cost will be 64% higher than the planned excision. And the hospital stay also will be longer. Of course, this was not significant, but there is a tendency for this to be uh, higher. As I was saying, radiation. So the main, the main uh, stay, uh, the cornerstone of, of the treatment is tumor bed excision, is the surgery. But there is adjuvant treatments or neoadjuvant treatments that can be used like radiation and chemotherapy. Mainly radiation, even though its role is not well defined yet for these um, cases, but it has been seen that more recently, we are using more neoadjuvant radiation. Neoadjuvant meaning radiation before the tumor bed excision. And there are some, some studies that shows that there is some benefit with for this with uh, high five-year local control rates, with high five-year local recurrence um, uh, free survival, and uh, five-year overall survival, like in this uh, study by, by Jones. Also, same thing, Alignette is uh, from France, from Lyon, 2023. Also, they they uh, they published that when there was um, a, the local recurrence when there was radiation was much lower than when there was not uh, radiation at ten years. Same thing where the local recurrence free survival was also higher in the case of radiation than in no radiation. However, we have to keep in mind that um, also when we're talking about uh, local recurrence free survival, uh, we have also to keep in mind that higher high grade tumors, deep seated, also will have you know this this problem. So it's not only a problem of of the unplanned excision, but also some characteristic of the tumor can uh, be involved from this. Um, same thing here, uh, uh, Sahid in 2016 also saw that um, the local recurrence rate of uh, unplanned excision was much higher, as, as we said before. And um, there was some uh, benefit of using uh, preoperative uh, radiation. They, they found in multivariate analysis that preoperative radiation and performance status led to improve um, these uh, oncological outcomes on, on, on the patients. Uh, now, there are some patients in which you are not going to be able to use surgery because of some clinical problems or there is too much morbidity in the procedure. Uh, maybe you will need to do an amputation and the patient doesn't want an amputation. So in those cases, um, only doing radiation might have some, some room. Uh, even, though, even though the local control rate in some studies has been very bad, KEPCA, in 2005 published this, this study where they found a very acceptable local control rate at five and 10 years in 88 and 86%. So we already have the tumor bed excision, radiation, now chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, the role of chemotherapy is very is really not well established, even in the cases where you are doing planned excisions of sarcomas. Uh, not all the institutions will give chemotherapy for soft, soft tissue sarcomas. So the role of this chemotherapy in unplanned excision is even less known or, you know, if it's beneficial uh, or not. Usually in the, the indication for chemotherapy 
will be patients at high risk for metastasis, meaning in stage three. Uh, two tumors more than five, deep seated, high grade. Or in patients that they have metastasis when they when they present. And these regimens are usually based on doxorubicin and ifosfamide. And uh, as I said before, the chemotherapy in these cases is still uh, controversial. Finally, regarding the prognosis, and this is um, what we found in, in our meta-analysis, um, you will see that there is a, a, a lower five-year uh, local uh, recurrence free survival. It will be, it's a, it's a risk factor to have this implant excision. Also, the, now, the five-year overall survival is not affected by the implant excision, so meaning that usually this overall survival, so the fact that they do the implant excision is not gonna affect really your overall survival. The overall survival will be more based on the tumor grade and the tumor size, meaning the biological behavior of the tumor itself. So this concept that well, some people say, oh, you know, they are gonna spread the tumor because they, 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 they took it like wrong, no? is not really uh, scientific, it, it has not been really scientific proven like with decreased uh, overall survival. Now, as, as we were saying before, the residual disease, it will affect negatively the five-year local recurrence free survival, as we can say here, risk ratio of 2.59. And the five-year uh, overall survival will be affected if there is a recurrence of the disease, okay? Uh, 1.82 risk ratio with a significant uh, value. So this is what I was saying before, it's not good to stay doing nothing and waiting until there is a recurrence in, this, in these patients. And finally, amputation rate, it has been um, seen in some uh, previous studies that in these cases of, uh, of implant excision, the amputation rates are higher because of these morbid resections but uh, we didn't really found this, uh, this problem in, in, in our side. So basically, um, plant excision is a big problem for us, for orthopedic oncologists. The, be the best way to approach this problem is prevention through education. Uh, the tumor bed excision is the standard, the standard of care, uh, but there are some groups that use this watch and see approach. Radiation therapy seems to be helpful in local control, chemotherapy, it will really depends on the guidance of each institution. There is, is still controversial. And the oncological outcomes are affected mainly the local recurrence, five years uh, local recurrence free survival. Overall survival and distant metastasis free survival seems to be more dependent on the nature of the primary tumor rather than the unplanned excision procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Um, you started by saying a very interesting uh, presentation, and indeed it is. Um, it is not only um, a, a difficult concept to grasp in regards to not being able to actually get to the bottom of what the issue is when you are confronting a tumor or, or a growth in someone's skin. Um, unplanned excision, and you did uh, quote, uh, surgery without preoperative uh, diagnostic modalities without the intent to achieve tumor-free margins. And then uh, you mentioned that, I think you mentioned 18 to 66% of the referrals that come out of this particular outcome are already sarcoma-driven uh, type of tumors that will have to be revised by a sarcoma specialist. That is kind of an alarming type of, uh, of statistics right there and then. I'm wondering, what is, uh, what is it that prompts a surgeon to actually go for an unplanned excision without necessarily having studied what that mass or that palpable mass that might not necessarily be, uh, uh, that, that would be indolent at the moment uh, is perhaps something that they needed to excise without investigating. Yeah. What what is that? What is the reason that pushes a doctor to do that? Yeah, so so that's a <laughs> that's a spicy question, probably, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, because I mean, you can start thinking about what you know why. 
for example, you know, this case that I had with this patient uh, uh, that went with 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 uh, her wife to the OBGYN. Right. And uh, with a bump on the posterior thigh, and he ended up having the mass resected by the OBGYN, right? And you say, I mean, this is a guy. Well, what an OBGYN is, is resecting a mass in the leg? And sometimes for me, it's a big mystery, you know, why, why they are doing these things. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I put myself, and, and you know what, this, this patient wanted to, wanted to sue this OEYN. Uh, and I, I told him not to do it because I might think, okay, this guy, this OEYN wanted to be helpful, right? He, he, he had a good intention, right? He wanted to solve the problem of the, of the guy. And this is the thing. Statistically, there is a ratio of 100 to 1 benign cases to malignant yeah. cases. Hmm. So if you also are a gambler, <laughs> you will say, okay, you know what I mean? I mean, of 100, one will be malignant. What are the odds for this to be malignant? And you think, oh, this is a lepom. Oh, this is a hematoma whatever you know what i mean so then you say okay you know i want to probably help this guy i don't want him to go around you know the doctor whatever this is more likely benign it's superficial i can take it right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they end up doing this so you know that that's my my You're... side you know that try to think why you know these these cases yeah. are being done you know, you reminded me, uh, Dr. Patel, we, we see more and more, obviously, depending on the uh, on how big the country is, uh, that uh, impetus of, uh, of dermatologists to actually go in and remove what they consider, because it is a movable type of a mass, they immediately label it as a lipoma. And yes. then, uh, obviously, they have to wait for pathology to come back, hoping that that is not necessarily a sarcoma. Uh, and that is perhaps one of the biggest issues that we have had but, in the but past. Also, also, that's kind of a miss, miss, in, uh, miss or lack of knowledge, right? Because we, we say, okay, the most common soft tissue mass that you will have is a light bomb, right? And during my presentation, you know, I show that Mm -hmm. The only, not the only, but the most easy mass to diagnose without a biopsy is a lipoma. A lipoma, absolutely. <laughs> with, a, with an MRI, right? So you don't have to wait to pathology. You can do an MRI and you will see it's a lipoma and then I take it out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't know if, you know, they want to save us, you know, the step of the MRI. Also, you know, insurance companies, I mean, it's a problem because they're very expensive, right? Or they deny the MRIs. I mean, uh, every MRI that I, I order, they are denied. And I have to be doing peer-to-peer. Peer Indeed, and MRI. perhaps I can shed some light on that as well. And it's a fact that uh, we don't necessarily have a gold standard for, uh, for these type of uh, referrals. Uh, but if we were to actually push a study such as the ones you have worked so diligently on and investigated and, and reported that 66% of these referrals end up in sarcoma, then someone will definitely take a look at it because obviously it is the risk for the patient, not for the insurance company. I mean, it, it, yes, you can no, at the end, go back at the end of the day, it. At the end of the day, it's more expensive for them because it these is. patients require more surgeries. And our surgery is done in a post-operative period of time. Not only that, but it will require radi radiotherapy, chemotherapy, as you probably exactly. mentioned in some institutions, and obviously multiple surgeries. So exactly. you, you very clearly stated. So I, I believe that uh, we are perhaps awakening our ourselves, especially as physicians, uh, to be very certain. And you were very, very clear in uh, actually studying those soft tissue uh, movable masses that perhaps are painless because of whatever reason or painful, uh, but uh, you really need to get a clear history. And that is definitely a, a very, um, a very uh, I will say, a, a pearl that we should all take, you know, to be very cautious 
do a comprehensive study, a comprehensive history on the patient and understand the reasons why this patient has developed that particular mass. Now, um, a question that uh, has always lingered in my mind that I heard in the past and, and, and just uh, reflected again, uh, would uh, those patients that receive radiotherapy would be propensed or are they propensed for development of sarcoma in the future? So, so there is um there is some subtype of of sarcoma uh, that is or can be associated to radiation. Okay. Uh, if, if we talk about soft tissue sarcoma, is the angiosarcoma, and then also patients receiving radiation, they can also be at risk of having bone sarcomas, like an osteosarcoma, mm -hmm. for example, in the future. As a complication, the years later. Years later. Yeah. And, and in your experience, Dr. Uh, Pertel, how often do you really need to take the patient back uh, to surgery for a revision or to remove extra tissue because now you consider that there might be a sarcoma spreading? Uh, you mean after an implant excision or after a plan excision? Well, either or. An, an implant, I know that that is a mess that you have to go in and, and just redo. Yeah, and so so but the, in, in your, for... In, for 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 plan excisions, uh, meaning oncological, you know, plan excisions, uh, it has been reported that depending on the tumor, but you can have up to seventeen percent of positive margins with a resection. Okay. Seventy seven zero. Seven no one zero. One seven. One, one seven. 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 Sorry, one seven. One seventeen. Okay. Seventeen. Okay. Um, depending on the on the tumor, mix of sarcomas can be even higher, like in the twenties, twenty five percent. Um, you know, so depending on the type of, of, of sarcoma. Um, I mean, fortunately, my positive margin rate is much lower than that. Thank God, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you can expect, you know, that average of, of positive margins. In an yeah. unplanned excision, in an unplanned excision, you can even have like double of that or even... Huh. Depending depending on, on that on the tumor. If it's a right. mix of viral sarcoma or the matofiral sarcoma protuberance, you can expect up to 42% of positive margins. So then you will have to re, you know, re-resect the uh, the tumor bed. You you did mention that uh, obviously uh rely on MRIs. I mean, obviously they, they might be expensive and not covered by insurance, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, 65% of the referrals for MRI to uh, diagnose uh, is good enough that it that the sensitivity is good enough for you to uh, acknowledge that the MRI is the way to go. So uh, is that uh, the perhaps in your mind the gold standard that you should follow every time you see this type of a mass to go if it is local MRI? Oh yeah. So so if you have a bump, um, you need to do an MRI. Yeah. I mean, even if you think it's a lipoma, you have to do the MRI. Even even if it's a hundred to one the ratio, benign malignant, you have to do the MRI. Right. Uh, now, if you want to go a little bit more cheaper, you can do an ultrasound. But as I say, the problem with the ultrasound is that it depends on who is doing the ultrasound. And who Correct. Is the, ultrasound. the position of the transducer and how how it. Uh, there is that the experience of the ultrasound yeah. of the ultrasound uh -huh. order, right? Yeah. Um, so if 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 I want to, you know do an ultrasound on a mass, I will have to refer to an MSK radiologist with experience in, you know, in soft tissue masses. I mean, anyone in the community cannot do a, a ultrasound for a soft tissue mass uh, because the interpretation, it might, might be a problem, no? But the MRI is more, is not dependent on who is doing the MRI, it's dependent on who is interpreting the MRI. So. The MRI is more general. Any you know, anyone with some expertise on MRI reading can take a look and and see what's going on no? with the tumor and see if there is any concerning features or not that you know that will uh, recommend you know warrant a biopsy or not. No, so that, right. that's the difference. So so post uh, the surgical excision of that particular sarcoma. Uh, do you typically refer for radio oncology, or what is the percentage of patients that will benefit from for radiotherapy? Oh yeah, so in my practice for sarcomas, um, I I am 
my philosophy is to do neo jugan radiation or before uh, okay. meaning uh, before before the the resection the radiation and in depending depending the sarcoma uh we recommend or not chemotherapy so the main thing is that all these patients with sarcomas we discuss in our tumor board tumor board yes a tumor board where we we meet together all the specialists medical oncology radiation oncology pathology radiologists orthopedic surgeons right so we all meet we discuss the patient and then you know based on consensus is that we do the, the recommendation so okay. usually the chemo is one of these uh, treatment modalities that uh, usually we discuss a lot uh, depending on the type of tumor and the type of sarcoma and then we we decide to do or not the chemotherapy yeah you did mention uh going back uh, slightly to um the uh potential risk factors uh that could produce uh these type of sarcomas um obviously you mentioned some of the um uh the substances that could be detrimental obviously to the health of an individual not only for tissue but other things but um, are there other risk factors that uh, that come to mind that uh, you have been concerned in the past that you should study deeply? Um, so there is some um, genetic mutations or genetic syndromes, like for example, Lee-Fraumeni syndrome. Uh, oh, look at know, that. Uh, so they, those patients, for example, are more prone for sarcomas, right? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, there's all, all, also some uh, tumors that are related to some mutations uh, that can predispose people to, to have, you know, the, these tumors. Um, you know, the, the risk factors are not so clear as with some carcinomas uh, because the main problem that we have with patients with soft tissue sarcomas or bone sarcomas is that we don't have too many patients, right? So for example, if you compare the new cases a year in the United States of breast cancer versus the new cases of soft tissue sarcomas, right? You will have a ratio of 20 to one, mm. 20 to one. So to do any type of study, to do any type of study, a study, let's say, uh, epidemi epidemiological study or treatment study, diagnostic study, whatever, we have no, we we have almost no no patients, right? Uh, while breast cancer, right? Research, they have thousands of patients mm -hmm. that exactly. they can try, you know, go in trials and things like that. So um, it, it's very difficult also to find associations right of risk factors with you know cause effect when you don't have too many patients so right. you have to you know it has to pass like many years in order mm -hmm. to have a, a decent amount you know of of patients right this in, in the population. exactly these epidemiological studies that, that are published in breast or you know prostate whatever they have hand, like ten thousand patients you know to to, that are included. For mm -hmm. us to have 10,000 patients, I mean, in a study, it will have to be like 10 years, <laughs> you know? I know, so, in order for you to have a substantial exactly. uh, number in a population for you to exactly. study. A substantial sample understood. study. Yeah, it's very similar to what pancreas specialists are going through simply because it's not too frequent that they see exactly. it. Uh, doctor, we have a few minutes and I do have two acknowledgements here. One question uh, from Ligia Veronica. Uh, and she says, good afternoon. Thank you for the great conference. The sarcoma is most frequently in male or females. And if sarcoma is every time associated to a previous trauma? Okay, so uh, regarding the epidemiology, um, it depends. It depends on the geographic uh, uh, region. Um, the statistics will change. In some regions, sometimes, you know, uh, women are a little bit more frequent than men. Others, men are a little bit more frequent than women. I will say that if you put everything together, probably are almost the same. There is no really a, a predisposition, even a woman or, or men. 
And then the other question uh, regarding the trauma. Uh, no, I mean, for example, this uh, seagull, right, in 2009, they found that there was association in the sense that the, that the, the patient was asked, right? Hey, do you have a do you have any trauma? And the patient will say, Oh yes, you know, and that was sixty five percent. So it's not all the cases, and and this is the thing, right? Human being that the humans, they want always to understand what is going on with them, right? And they want to know, or they 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 like to have an explanation for things. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bump, the normal it will say, oh, I had a trauma. So right. they, that's why I have a bump, right? So that's why, you know, you, they always try to associate, you know, a trauma with, with a bump. Uh, and you ask, oh, do you have a, a trauma? Oh, yes, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I got a trauma. Right? So it's normal. I mean, isn't the human, you know, the human nature, you know, to try to have an explanation. Yeah. But many times, no. I mean, these, these bumps appear and they start growing and there is no... And the other thing is that people always, because this, and this is the important thing, these tumors are usually painless, painless. They don't hurt. So when there is no pain, people think, oh, this is not bad, right? But they start growing and growing and growing. But also it's human nature to have the hope for things to go away. So they don't do anything. And because it's not hurting, they say nothing is going, nothing is bad. But they keep growing, growing, and they start thinking, oh, you know, this is going to go. I mean, it's growing, but this is going to go. Right. They never go. So then when they come to the office, they have huge masses. It's slightly too late. And it's, it, it, it's late, you know. It's so bad. So that's, you know, that's the, um, that's the important thing of sarcomas, that they don't hurt. And if you have a bomb that is growing, growing, and growing, then you should, you know, take a look. And also you have to think that maybe it's not a lipoma. Right? right. So so those three things, you know, are things that you have to have in mind. And I think that if you only have those three things, then you can start, you know, thinking about sarcomas in the way we want, you know, people to, to think about sarcomas. To be proactive and think of it as such. Exactly. Uh, one last comment and is from Dr. Jesus Andres Moya. He says, thank you for this very important talk for our daily practice. And I do want to end with this and thank you, Dr. Patel, for your time or for this incredible presentation. You got me going, uh, understanding or trying to understand more about sarcomas. And on behalf of our entire team at uh, Baptist Health International, uh, we are so grateful to you and, and welcome once again to our team at Miami Cancer Institute. Uh, for this informative presentation and for all of you for participating and for your questions, of course. If you have additional questions about today's presentation or if you do have a concern or you want to consult directly with Dr. Patel, please send us an email at bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. Again, that is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. We'll make sure to forward that to Dr. Patel for him to respond back to you. We look forward to seeing you all in our next Oncology Lecture Series. Uh, this one, uh, the next one will be scheduled uh, for Wednesday, July 7th, 2024. Once again, thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.